Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Alexander Anderson and Andrew Harvey. Alexander is a researcher at the Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town, and he is the Regional Coordinator for Africa at the Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. His interests include language documentation and language typology. Andrew is a junior professor at the University of Bayreuth's Faculty of Languages and Literatures. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. Please join me in welcoming Alexander and Andrew as they give their talk, Interjections in Gorwa, Examining Instability. Thank you very much, Martha, and thank you so much for, for everyone for attending this talk and having us here. Uh, so this talk is dedicated to the issue of the formal instability of interactives. Interactives are constructions that provide insights into how speakers conceive themselves in the world of social communication. They are defined as invariable deictic forms that are set off from the surrounding text semantically, syntactically, and prosodically, and can neither be negated nor questions. The class of interactives includes uh, attention signals, directives, discourse markers, evaluatives, idiophones, onomatopoeias, interjections, response solicitators, response signals, social formula, evocatives, and cognitive animal calls. The list is quite long. While claimed in several studies, the formal instability of lexical classes of interactive grammar and the extent thereof have not been demonstrated empirically in a systematic manner. To address this gap, we study one category of interactives, namely interjections in Gorwa. Interjections are operationally defined as uh, lexical construct lexicalized constructions that express feelings and sensations experienced by the speaker and are usable or can be used in a holophrastic manner, meaning as non-elliptical utterances. Let me now allow Andrew to introduce the heroes of our talk, the Gorwa people and their language. Thanks, uh, Alex. So um, given that most of you in our audience today are familiar with Gorwa and the larger context in which this research took place, I won't spend too much time on background information here. In terms of geography, Gorwa is spoken in the area immediately surrounding Lake Babati, the capital city of Manyara region. And Gorwa is a southern Cushitic language of the larger Cushitic family, itself a, mem a member of the Afroasiatic phylum. Most Gorwa today practice a form of sedentary agriculture, but cattle are still an important part of their cultural practices and identity. Gorwa is spoken by around 133,000 people, but due to several factors, including massive demographic changes, restrictions on domains of use, and attitudes towards the language itself, Gorwa should be considered an endangered language. In terms of uh, the research itself, uh, in short, no previous work has looked at the phenomena we will be looking at today in Gorwa. Again, this won't come as a surprise to the audience of today's talk, looking at the Rift Valley Network's online library of materials on Gorwa, the totality of available works that mention the language in any substantial way is less than 30, with much of this existing as unpublished manuscripts, or more recently, presentations given here at the Rift Valley Network. I give less than three pages to idiophones in my doctoral dissertation, but what we will be looking at today is entirely different from this. According to the definition we provide before, interactives are invariable in the sense that they, they do not alter their form depending on the position in a sentence. They are indeclinable, uninflected, and do not contain affixes or morphemes other than the rote itself. However, Interactives are also unstable, flexible, and mutable. This instability is much more pronounced in the interactive part of grammar than what characterizes the lexical classes of sentence grammar, such as verbs, nouns, adjectives, adverbs, etc. 
although the extent of this instability may certainly be different in different categories of interactives, uh, it seems to typify interactive grammar in its entirety. Interjections, the protagonists of our research, also seem to be phonetically and morphologically unstable. This has been observed in Hausa, Maasai, Korean, Polish, Hebrew, Aramaic, Ugaritic, and several other languages. Nevertheless, although the formal instability of interactives in general and interjections more specifically seems beyond doubt, the qualitative and quantitative extent of this, as well as the characteristics of this instability and the mechanisms underlying it, have been studied neither in a detailed nor systematized manner. Our talk today and the article that we wrote with Andrew responds to this knowledge gap by dealing with instability issue specifically and systematically. The operationalized definition of interjections is largely simplified. More appropriately, the category of interjections is viewed as a radial network of internally diverse exemplars that are organized around an interjective prototype. The prototype is defined cumulatively and in addition to the features mentioned in the operational definition I mentioned before, is characterized by, by a set of functional and formal properties. Interjections attested in a language or across languages exhibit, of course, a varying extent of similarity with the prototype. Items that fully comply with the prototype are canonical and placed in the center of the category, as you can see in this picture. In contrast, items whose compliance is minimal and uh, uh, are non-canonical and populate the category's peripheries. As a result, the category emanates from its nucleus, exemplified by the prototype, to the margins where it gradually transmutes to, uh, into other categories. The key element in this radial network, of course, is the prototype. Given cross-linguistic data, both synchronic and diachronic and cognitive evidence, scholars have proposed a, a, cum a cumulative set of prototypical interjective features, semantic, pragmatic, phonetic, morphological, and syntactic. Here, I mention properties related to phonetics and morphology, since only these are relevant for our study. Phonetically, prototypical interject, a prototypical interjection is monosyllabic, make, makes use of vocalic material, which also includes guttural and palatal approximants, allows for extra systematic sounds and sounds combinations, and is accompanied by marked phonation. Morphologically, a prototypical interjection is monomorphemic, with no inflections, no derivations, or elements added via compounding, and it is overall opaque, lacking any specific morphological traits that could identify it as a member of the interjective category. Given the framework adopted in our research and the scope of our study, we wanted to respond to the following research question. Are interjections in Goa formally unstable? And should this be the case, what are the characteristics of this instability? To confront this question, we determined the respective contributions of shared open lectal uh, interjective tokens and idiolectal interjective tokens to the total pool of interjections and studied the properties of these two subclasses. Data on interjections is elusive. And what I mean by that is because of their very nature, they do not commonly uh, occur in careful speech, the kind of stuff that people might produce if you have a recording device in front of them. And they're often not incidentally produced in context in contexts such as elicitation. Um, in addition to this, developing a corpus of natural speech large enough for the systematic study of interjections therein is a massive undertaking. And as such, the approach that we've used in the past and continued to develop is kind of a form of targeted elicitation. Um, so for our previous work on emotive interjections in Hadza, we employed a method which involved developing a series of situations which two speakers would play out, speaking back and forth and producing a targeted interjection therein. So here we have uh, John Jaiko Husainia and Gonga Petro as they acted out a situation in which one of them steps on a thorn with the targeted interjection being the sound one would produce when experiencing that kind of pain. For this context and setting, the method worked pretty well. 
For Gorwa, on the other hand, I found that this kind of setup wasn't as effective. Um, and instead, using a similar list of target sensations or emotions to elicit, I created a series of framing situations and asked six Gorwa speakers what word or sound they would use in each. So here we have one of my Gorwa consultants, Hezekiah Cody, in a setup largely like the one that we had when we were eliciting these interjections. In this case, I might say something like, you're walking through the forest and you step on a thorn. What Gorwa word or sound might you use? And this proved to be an effective method in this circumstance. And basically the same quantity and richness of forms were collected for Gorwa as for Hadza. In the end, I, I'm not convinced that there's any one method that is better than the other, and I'm sort of content to keep on exploring how to do this more effectively. All our fieldwork activities, uh, they allowed us to collect 91 uh, interjections, 25 are panlectal, while 66 were idiolectal. Um, the 25 pan-lectal interjections uh, are defined by being shared by two or more speakers. That is, the form and meaning of these interjections are identical in the language of more than a single person, which suggests at least some degree of pan-lectal status of these tokens and uh, their cross-population spread. So this table presents all such shared interjections in alphabetical order, specifies their meanings in terms of emotions and sensations, and provides the reference to the particular speakers who used the respective tokens. The 66 idiolectal interjections have only been produced by a single person in our uh, set and are not shared by two or more speakers. So uh, this table introduces these uh, interjections, and we'll see more of uh, these both uh, as the presentation goes on. In terms of results, our data shows that in Gorwa, the grammatical profiles of panlectal and idiolectal interjections are virtually identical. So whether they're panlectal or idiolectal, they show basically the same characteristics. This similarity is evident despite the disproportion characterizing the two interjective classes. So 73% of interjections are idiolectal, while only 27% are panlectal, that is, are shared. And uh, the different extents of access to idiolectal tokens by the individual speaker. So the most creative speaker uh, had about 36 of their uh, individual idiolect uh, interjections were actually idiolectal. So 36% 36 of the interjections that they produced uh, were um, uh, produced uniquely by them, while our, let's say, our least creative um, participant only produced 10% of uh, interjections that weren't shared by at least one other speaker. So only 10% of their interjections were um, idiolectal. Um, so now I'd like to uh, summarize the properties that typify both classes of interjections. Um, to begin with, while some shared and idiolectal tokens are, lective, uh, are lexically distinct or lexically distinctive, many, um, in fact, most of them yield these form function clusters. So the lexemes of each of these clusters are connected through family resemblance. So each token shares some formal or functional properties with another member of the cluster or at least some of them. Um, However, no formal or functional feature need be identical for all members of the cluster, which means in turn that no feature is essential to the cluster by, constituting, or by uh, constituting its common denominator. Such clusters may range from simpler to highly complex. This figure presents the semantic family resemblance of the members of what we have called the AH cluster. Yeah, uh, regarding phonetics, uh, the majority of shared and idiolectal interjections are monosyllabic or are built around monosyllabic segments. Very few tokens consist of two syllables or a series of identical disyllabic segments. Interjections very abundantly draw on vocalic material, genuine vowels, or what we refer to as quasi-vocalic elements. This latter class includes approximants as well as fonts strongly related to approximants and vowels. 
And indeed, most interjections only consist of vowels and such quasi-vocalic elements. In contrast, only six shared interjections and only 26 idiolectal interjections draw on both vocalic and genuine consonantal material. And in fact, only one interjection draws exclusively on consonants. Similarly, while a variety of vowels and quasi-vocalic elements are attested in panlectal and idiolectal interjections, there are only two genuine consonants attested in shear interjections, the dental stop t, which actually features only in four tokens of the same TAT cluster, and the dental click found in one token only. In idiolectal interjections, the set of consonants is significantly larger and includes more consonants, uh, prop, genuine consonants. Interjections often exploit guttural forms, whether glottal, pharyngeal, or uvular. Among these, the glottal form, uh, the, the glottal forms, uh, the stop and the and the approximant, are the most frequent. In the 25 shared interjections, guttural actually feature in 18 tokens, and the vast majority of fonts that are not genuine vowels are actually gutturals. Simultaneously, interjections exhibit a very strong preference for the vowel A. Interjections may make use of extra systematic sounds, which are API sounds, in contrast, non-API sounds are unattested in our data, even in idiolectal interjections. The extra systematicity of GORA interjections is much more visible in phonotactics and transpires through the exaggerated degrees of length. For instance, extra long and even longer vowels and extra systematic syllable structures, which a few forms of which you can find on this slide. Interjections, both shared and idiolectal, allow for five tone types, extra low, low, middle, high, and extra high. Only high, middle, and low are systematic in the standard phonetic system of Gorwa, which means that extra high and extra low tones are marked from sentence grammar's perspective. The tone of the first vowel tends to be high or extra high and in any case higher than the tone of the subsequent tone carriers. This means that most interjections, the vast majority of them in fact, exhibit a decreasing tonal patterns. And some examples of this decreasing tonal patterns you can find on this slide too. The phonation of interjections is, or at least can always be marked with loudness and articular. Uh, artic uh, articulatory force being the most typical realizations. Indeed, interjections can be performed in a more or less dramatic manner, depending on the need and the appropriateness of the display of expressivity. Regarding morphology, nearly all shared, inter share, both shared and dialectal interjections collected by us are primary. Interjections tend to be structurally simple, they are monomorphemic with no inflections, derivations, or elements added through compounding. The only exceptions involve one secondary interjection, which consists of two morphemes, the noun I and the imperative bring, and a few primary uh, interjections that are combination of independent primary tokens. And all of these are idiolectal interjections, actually. Interjections often exploit replicative structure, structures. The following replications are tested in our data, red duplication, quad replication, quintuplication, and sex duplication. While one may sometimes see a certain degree of semantic relationship between non-replicative forms and replications, none of the replicative interjections can be divided into genuine, more basic meaning-bearing units. These interjections constitute holistic replicative patterns, and replication is therefore a phonetic expressive device rather than a genuine derivative strategy, which is also very common in interactives across languages. Overall, the category of interjections is structurally opaque. It lacks any specific morphological trait that could identify a construction as, an, as the member of, a, of an interjective category. This is evident if one compares the secondary interjection 
of the only one secondary interjection that we actually have with all primary interjections. It is, however, also patent through and among primary interjections themselves. Certainly, morphological simplicity itself could be regarded as a characteristic of at least primary interjections. But simple morphology or morphomorphemic monomorphemic structure is certainly not limited to interjections in Gorwa, but also characterizes the other categories of interactive grammars. Grammar. The, this, uh, the same applies to replications, which are not restricted to interjections, but appear in several interactive categories as well. Although the similarity of shared and inter in idiolectal interjections uh, is clear, which we explain now, two minor differences can be identified. First, idiolectal interjections attest to more types of extra systematic sounds and sound combination combinations than is the case of shared interjections. Secondly, more examples of morphological complexity, in particular compounding, are found in idiolectal interjections than shared interjections. Although these differences may simply be due to the larger number of idiolectal tokens collected in our study, they may also reflect the inherent developmental dissimilarities of idiolectal and shared tokens. So the presence of compounding in idiolectal interjections reflects a grammaticalization process. Cross-linguistically interjections can be accumulated, forming chains of inter interjective tokens. Such chains may gradually acquire, ac acquire a more fixed constructional status, forming semi-analytical syntactic and semi-synthetic morphological structures. Since grammatical novelties are first coined idiolectally from where some of them spread across large, a larger number of speakers and become more entrenched and stabilized across the population, one expects to find more interjective compounds in idiolectal interjections. And this is exactly the case of Gorwa. Similarly, the greater visibility of extra systematic sounds and sound combinations in idiolectal interjections stems from the lesser tameness of idiolectal construction than uh, that is uh, that is the lim limited, much more limited adjustment to the grammatical norms of the language and inversely an incomplete loss of expressiveness. With the entrenchment of interjective tokens and this spread across population, this expressivity generally decreases. And since grammaticalization is correlated with the increasing frequency, one of the reasons and exponents of which is exactly the spread of a construction across speakers, tokens shared by a number of speakers are expected to be more grammatically integrated and tamed. In contrast, idiolectal tokens are expected to be more expressive, less tamed, and characterized by a greater degree of extra systematic systematicity, exactly as we see it in our Gorwa data. All of this suggests that even though we studied share, shared and idiolectal interjections as distinct classes, these two sets should not be viewed as discrete or disconnected. On the contrary, they are connected through grammaticalization processes and are related to each other both diachronically and conceptually. They differ in the extent of their entrenchment and spread across Gora speakers, and as the consequence thereof, the extent of grammatical tameness and an inverse loss of expressivity. Overall, our data demonstrates that the Gorwa interjections are highly unstable. This instability stems from two main phenomena. Firstly, the larger number of idiolectal interjections, which is characteristic of Gorwa speakers, suggests on its own that interjections are prone to mutations. Individual speakers easily create new interjections, either by forming them by analogy to the patterns that exist in the language or by modifying such existing patterns. This leads to the proliferation of idiolectal tokens. Secondly, and constituting a result of the above phenomenon of fact, the majority of interjections, both idiolectal and shared form clusters, that is spaces composed of similar interjective constructions connected through the family resemblance of a formal, phonetic and morphological, and functional meaning related type. The variants of a cluster or the members included in it 
can be achieved through the following processes. Lengthening of vowels or consonants, even to the, the exaggerated degrees of length, replication of a segment in sequences of two, four, five, six, or more, exploitation of different tonal and uh, phonational patterns, modification of one of the features in a particular phone, or modification of a number of features within a segment. Of course, an interjection may also be modified by combining it uh, with other interjections, and all these strategies are not mutually exclusive, but certainly may be exploited simultaneously. The large set of possible modifications suggests that the morphophonetic shape of a construction expressing a given emotion is less crucial than the intonational, phonational, and even gestural prompts that are accessible to speakers. This, uh, as these uh, intonational, phonational, and gestural strategies are common to everyone in a language community, speakers can easily produce and decipher an unlimited number of dialectal interjective variations and pair them with an accurate emotion. Consequently, all types of morphophonetic forms are potentially compatible with any given emotion as long as the intonation, phonation, and even gesture disambiguate them, perhaps with, within certain constraints related to the iconicity of interjections expressing physical sensations. All of this means that interjections should not be approached from an essentialist either or perspective typical of approaches that draw on the idea of neat, stat static, and binary oppositions. Interjections should rather be dealt with from a dynamic, fuzzy, and complex system perspective. Instead of a system of clearly cut lexicalized constructions, we are in fact faced with a fluid system of interjective clusters in which borderlines between respective tokens are gradient, fuzzy, and fluctuating. This figure schematizes such a dynamic, fuzzy, network-driven model of an interjection. On the one hand, a particular emotion is expressed by a set of related forms which can be manipulated through the various strategies that we explained previously. Each form is characterized by a set of formal properties, starting with properties A, B, C, which through these strategies can be changed to gradually more different ones. On the other hand, for formally similar interjections may gradually diverge from the input meaning by acquiring new semantic values and losing some of the meanings associated, associated with the other related forms. And similar to what characterizes the form, the meaning here represented with senses one, two, three in the first of the central uh, uh, box would gradually become more distant. Both the formal and functional properties of a cluster are connected via family resemblance, and it is the family resemblance that provides the coherence and unity to the cluster, despite the fact that two distant members of the network need not have any morphophonetic or semantic properties in common. Additionally, our study corroborates the validity of an interjective prop, uh, prototype, and the minor exceptions that are attested in secondary interjections and a few idiolectal interjections have also been noted in previous scholarship. However, the absence of non-IPA sounds in the GORA data is really puzzling since the presence of such noises is really expected, especially in idiolectal tokens. Nevertheless, our study also suggests certain refinements to the interjective prototype. Interjections expressing sensations may have a, an iconic foundation. In Gorod, the sensations that give rise to imitative interject, interjections involve cold, imitation of shivering, good taste, imitation of sm uh, smacking one's lips, bad or good smell, uh, imitation of spitting. Although infrequent, interjections may also draw on the so-called baby talk or a register employed when talking to infants and toddlers. The glide or sem semi-vowel yi is more common in interjections than, uh, than wood. The same phenomenon has been observed also in Hadza, Arusha, Maasai, and Thosa. Interjections exhibit preference for high or extra high tone on the first syllable vowel or mora and a decreasing tonal pattern. A similar phenomenon is found in Hadza and Arusha Maasai. 
Should interjections include extra systematic sounds, these are much more likely to be gutturals and clicks. Curiously, interjections in Galois violate a pervasive cross-linguistic trend whereby clicks found in interactives in non-click languages are employed mainly as standalone or sequences of clicks. Despite that despite being a non-click language, interjection in Gora allow, allow for the use of clicks as genuine click consonants accompanied by vowels and other consonants. And finally, interjections are char characterized by the A or A plus a place of articulations, articulation visible through the preference for the A type vowels and gutturality found in elements other than genuine vowels. This has also been observed in interjections in Hebrew, Hausa, Arusha, and our own work on interjections in Hadza. Thank you very much. And now we are curious to hear what you think about and uh, would like to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be opened to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, that is also still possible. You can do so using the Zoom chat module, and I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Savan? Uh, yes, I'd, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd like to get back to the question, um, to a very basic question, namely the question of uh, methodology. So I, I'd like you to ex explain me a bit more how you collected these, as if I understood correctly, exclusively emotive interjections. So what were the framing questions and how were they developed? I mean, this probably needs some prior knowledge in which context interjections are actually used. And so uh, how did you come up with these frames? And did you then also take the, the interjections that you got through these questions from one speaker and submitted them to the other speaker to comment on, for instance? Thanks, uh, Yvonne. I, I appreciate sort of, yeah, that attention to the methodology because that was sort of the central part of um, of, of, of my, I guess, my job in, the, uh, in, in this whole uh, thing. And uh, so we had a list of of situations that would we thought would elicit a an emotional or an emotive interjection uh, response. We 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 had it through uh, previous work uh, with uh, Hadza, which actually was inherited from previous work that was done with Arusa Masai. Um, which was, you know, which which is available in published materials. So when I took this stuff from the Arusa Masai. Uh, I said, okay, how do I adapt this to a Hadza situation here? What sort of what sort of daily activities would be occurring that might that might elicit a, an emotive interjection response here? So, um, you know, uh, I I agree that like a lot of it was actually sort of just making it specific to sort of the everyday universe that Hadza people might um, live in, and so then. Uh, I basically, having done that, I, I I took that and then I said, okay, well, well, how do we adjust this uh, for a Gorwa um, uh, context? Um, and I mean, to an extent, I mean, a lot of the uh, larger animals that might uh, that might um, uh, elicit an emotive interjection are kind of you know the same animals that Gorwa people would be familiar with. Um, the kinds of food were maybe a little bit different. Uh, the kinds of um, the kinds of uh, of ways that you might encounter different uh, different sensations, for example, like leaving a house, for example, uh, uh, that was warm inside and then going outside. Um, so uh, to answer sort of your question, this was yeah, this was very much sort of like me thinking of oh well, what would be you know what's a situation in which I've heard people produce sounds that sort of might be might be interesting to us, and so I made this uh, sort of list. And in terms of the actual delivery, this was a little bit different every time. You know, I would sit down and we would and we would just talk, and I would say, "Hey, you know, okay, what if we what if we were in this situation? 
and you know, you sort of explain, you set up a little situation. You know, okay, you're walking uh, to work, or you're walking down to um, you're walking down to where you often tend your cattle. Or um, if I was with somebody else, I said, okay, well, you're going to visit your sister, and I know that their sister is, you know, is a little ways through a, a place where there are thorns. And, you know, and then you see what the, what the, so there was no sort of, there was no sort of static, um, uh, standardized uh, frame as such. Like I wasn't reading off of a script. It was very much sort of um, making up the, uh, the context uh, on the fly, but, uh, but essentially the concept was the same moving from a warm building into a cold building uh, or moving from a warm building into the cold um, uh, being offered food that you um, weren't expecting to get. And it's much better than what you expected to get. So um, this was, you know, this was kind of um, one of the situations. And then it, uh, you mentioned something at the end, and this is quite cool because I didn't do this, but I think it would be a very cool sort of follow-up. Um, for all of the work that we've done, and that is isolating these um, these uh, emotive interjections and getting uh, other people to listen to them. So uh, instead of doing the, um, I guess, sort of translation, what you're doing is you're doing a back translation. Then you're starting with the emotive interjection, and then you're getting the um, person to uh, tell you what that means. Uh, uh, so I didn't do that. But I think it would be really neat. Um, and maybe one of the reasons why I didn't want to do it this time is I was a little bit afraid that um, it would um, it might prime them in a sense, like we might not get the diversity that we were looking for. This was an issue with at least one of our um, one of our uh, informants who really sort of like uh, stuck on one uh, interjection. And uh, it was uh, less of sort of an emotive interjection, let's say, but it was more of sort of an attention getter. It was like, oh, hey, like, look at what's going on. So whether you're stepping on a thorn, you could say, hey, look, I just stepped on a thorn. Or you could, you know, you if you were, if you saw an elephant coming, you could say, hey, look, there's an elephant. So I was getting a lot of, hey, look, instead of the actual emotive reaction. So the individual was wanting to call other people to uh, the attention. Uh, so I think it would be I think it would be a really cool um, sort of uh, exercise to do that, and um, I, I think it would I think it would give us uh, possibly a different kind of data than the one that we were looking for. I mean, in this sense, we were sort of casting a really wide net and trying to pull up as many different uh, emotive interjections as possible. Whereas I think this particular method would be more so trying to. Uh, first of all, to figure out if these uh, sounds were recognized by other speakers, so to figure out their level of conventionalization, but then also to um, sort of understand the semantics uh, behind these uh, behind these uh, emotive interjections to sort of like, you know, to sort of uh, get a more specific sense of what of what these mean or what they could mean. Uh, so I appreciate that. I think that that's I think that that's a really good um, uh, that's a really good suggestion. Uh, yes, I'm asking this because um, somehow this methodology that you applied somehow presupposes that you know what common emotions are there and what common interjections in this context are. And we know by experience that emotions are <laughs> really not universal. And so this other way back shows you that maybe one is... I mean, that, I mean, you gave a frame and you got an interjection, but that this interjection is used also in much other frames, or that's, that's why I ask. So there's the risk with this methodology that you are actually, uh, I mean, you are really delimiting your, your, uh, your area very much. Uh, and um, yeah, and by asking back others, you might get much more messy data than you have collected in this way. Which is, of so course, I, uh, which I... is, of course, what we're going for. Um, though I would push back a little bit in terms of, um, you know, the way that we, th this form of elicitation actually eliciting one very specific form of elicitate or one very specific uh, form of emotive interjection because the no, situations one form, are open. One specific frame. Pardon? One very specific frame. Yeah. You, I, I think mean, that I, I think that maybe I think that maybe uh, the idea of one specific frame. I mean, the question the question wasn't, uh, you know, uh, the question wasn't uh, what sort of sound do you produce when you experience pain, specifically yes. sharp pain that might be in, in, induced by a thorn. Now, yes. the situation was stepping on a thorn. 
But yes. is that somebody then going to respond by uh, by saying, okay, this is a situation in which I produce an emotive interjection that has to do with experiencing a sharp pain? Or would this uh, would this involve uh, an emotive interjection with somebody experiencing, uh, somebody um, emoting the fact that they'd had bad luck? Or would this be like this lady that we were working with who uh, her reaction would be, I want to call people because I've just stepped on a thorn and I want somebody to help me pull it out. So I would say that we were not getting boilerplate um, responses. Alex, you have your hand up. You go. Yeah, because I wanted to say that we did not come with pre-established types of emotions. We created situations that would prompt some emotive response. But what kind of emotion would be generated in the speaker's mind? This was only observed by us after the, right. what the speaker said. So we didn't okay. ask them okay. to, to, to create... Uh, to deliver and uh, uh, convey an emotion or word that would express happiness or disappointment, because of course these are very much language embedded and language specific things. But we created uh, situations that we found likely to create some sort of emotive response, what of whatever nature it is. And what we were also very much interested in, what Angel, uh, and Andrew said, is variation and especially emo uh, especially interjections that would be first come to mind in uh, each speaker's uh, mm. performance. But of course, the, we, we, it's, it's absolutely true that it would be great to sort of, sort of check whether the same interjections or similar interjections are shared by, by other speakers. And also what would be great to actually describe each of these emotions or, in, or the semantic potential of each of the lexeme. Many of them are very polysemous actually. Mm -hmm. But to describe it uh, with uh, terms more appropriate for the language itself, because our description, of course, was done from the perspective of the English English language. And this already constrains what we can express, because yes. emotions you are completely right. Emotions are expressed. Mm -hmm. They are different emotions in different languages. So this is a constraint and limitation of our study, definitely. But our our our, our real focus was on morphophonetic var variability and instability mm -hmm. rather than semantics and pragmatic mm -hmm. sense was true. Yeah. So I hope that you know we yeah. can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, good. Yeah, yeah I mean, the question the question um, sort of elicits a really good uh, clarification, certainly. I mean, you know, yeah, rather than sort of going in with your set categories, yeah, what you're kind of doing is you're saying, okay, what what sort of responses might, what sort of situations might evoke a response, let's say, everyday situations, and you know. And it's a, you are completely right. It's a, it's a, such a difficult way to elicit uh, interjections and describe them because they are so intangible in many many aspects and but so so each work each each field work each uh each paper each research actually makes us sort of more maybe even not better but to understand the depth and all the problems associated with it and we may not have answers but we definitely see the problems <laughs> fun Hi, thanks so much for the talk. I have two questions, if if I can. So the the first is again about the stimuli. Did you have? I'm interested in olfactory, tactile, and auditory stimuli that might be, you know, nice feeling like a cat that's on my lap versus sticking your hand in something gooey, you know, a screechy noise versus a pleasant noise. And of course, these could differ cross linguistically, and 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 of course about the olfactory terms as well. So w were those included in your stimuli, or would you consider doing that in the future? So why don't I let you answer that, and then I'll get to my next question, which is quite different. Cold water versus uh, the sensation of laying out in the sun, for example. Um, we had things like tasting a delicious food versus tasting a food that had gone off, or tasting a food that wasn't really appealing to you, uh, but not uh, not sort of vile, you know, something that was just unappealing. We had, you know, so so very different sort of um, gustatory, tactile uh, uh, things. So pleasant also uh, um, in terms of unpleasant as well. And uh, this varied sometimes. If people, for example, if people liked spicy food, uh, the response would be different as uh, if somebody uh, did not like spicy food. So we had... It's slightly different. 
I was thinking about how I could, you know, somebody, I saw someone tasting something I could say yuck or yum, that I could actually put question intonation on that interjection in English. No. <laughs> uh, so my other question is, is uh, different. Uh, did you uh, transcribe or categorize if someone took an in-breath? Like, you know, it could be a quite silent in-breath. Now you could transcribe that as a voiceless awe, for instance, but I, I'm wondering if some of these awes might be a lexicalized form of just a, an in-breath. Uh, that's a great point, Bonnie. Thank you so much. We will definitely look back into the data because what you mentioned, I've noticed that in several languages uh, that there are uh, interjections that are in brief interjections, actually. And of course, some languages have the, have lexicalized them tremendously, like several Scandinavian languages. Right. And, and I'll language. definitely want to see that in your paper. <laughs> in <some laughs> so we, we can we can double, we can check it again. Yeah, oh, that's a yeah. great point. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this clustering process that you did, how that worked, and what sort of parameters you were using to make those decisions? So here, each uh, circle is actually an interjection that has a form uh, that is somehow similar to its adjacent neighbor, and they also share the squares, then all this sort of semantic potential and there is overlap in meanings uh, and of course this this these meanings are they are simplified because only some type of uh, types of emotions have been profiled here in this in these pictures so two interjections or three interjections can have can share one meaning which is for instance surprise and, and of course surprise itself can be a very complex emotion and some other interjections uh, uh, share some some other uh, some other meanings, and so this is a very it's it's not maybe simplified picture, but it's a uh, more schematic in the sense that it's it we tried to make sort of uh, provide some sort of unity or organization to something that is extremely messy. So this is definitely a polished up. Or, or really like 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 of yeah over neat uh picture of because e each of these interjections has of course a semantic potential that it's very difficult to puzzle them into this coherent semantic map or that would be connected via family resemblance so so yeah so i mean the messiness is just tremendous and we were trying to put some some type of order into this mess yeah, that makes sense. My question is, so how did you decide what was and wasn't um, phonologically similar? And how did you um, analyze what the emo emotions that were attached were and how those related to each other? So in, ter in terms of emotions, we tried to, to, to draw on the largest categories possible because the larger a category is, the uh, let's say the le the less problematic it is from a language uh, like language internal perspective from from my research, I I, I it looks like uh, if you if we zoom in and narrow an, an emotion to a very specific emotion type, then it's very difficult to or more difficult to find it clearly defined or like distinguished cross linguistically, and. So here, the, the clustering is may, mainly organized around different emotions, uh, emotion types that are shared. So here, this clustering does not take into consideration strict similarity between, uh, between the adjacent forms. We just grouped all the interjections that, sh that look similar and have some similar meaning and try to, via meaning, connect them to each other forming this 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 semantic map but of course other clusterings are possible because this is just a mental map that brings some sort of order to a me to, to messy data so this is not something that of course exists in speakers brains we don't claim that it doesn't it doesn't reflect a diachronic uh, let's say spread of one interjection to another interjection it's just sort of a mental map trying us to make uh yeah make sense of this uh of, of of this mess of interjections that are similar but yet dif distinct 
I should also mention, um, Martha, regarding the uh, like the interpretation of the semantics of these. I think that that was part of your question as well. Um, sometimes, I mean, we're you know, like like Yvonne had said, I mean, this is an outsider doing research on a community that they are not part of. Um, I've spent a lot of time working with Gorba, but that doesn't give me any, you know, doesn't necessarily give me any more insight. Um, or doesn't certainly doesn't give me the insight of an insider or a speaker of the language themselves. So a lot of the, this was during this process, uh, paying attention to um, the other things that were going on. So we talked about gesture. We talked about things like facial expression. We talked about how they responded to the situation. Sometimes I would start setting up a situation and they would, you know, they would give feedback as we were going. They said, okay, all right, something is going to happen. Um, and then also um, they would sometimes, uh, very often, uh, give the interjection as part of um, sort of a larger phrase. So, uh, you know, if you know what's being said in the language and how this is being framed, they might say something. So, in this uh, in this situation of being given food that they didn't that you know that they didn't want, they were expecting to get something, and then somebody came and gave them food that you know they didn't want. It was a less appealing food. You know, you've asked for barbecue and you get porridge or something, right? Um, sometimes you would get people would make this sound and uh, they would make a sound, and it was clear, you know, by looking up and by saying something you could tell that they were speaking to the person who was bringing the food to them, right? So that was more of a sound of indignation, disgust, right? Other times you might see them looking down, you know, and they might be speaking at a sort of a, a, a quieter and a quieter sort of voice. And this to me is like, you know, they're sort of speaking to either the person sitting across from them at the table or they are alone, right? And this is sort of part of you know, them thinking about themselves. Oh gosh, like this is, you know. Uh, so you could get a lot of this. And so this involved sort of note-taking as as these things were being uh, were being produced and also listening to what they were saying afterwards. Are they speaking to a to a person bringing them food? Are they speaking to themselves? Are they speaking to their 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 seatmate? Like what what's going on here? Are they yelling out to to their sister who lives down the road? Like what what's going on? So this you know it's all of these clues. We talked about how this is sort of a rich experience. So how do you interpret these clues? Uh, and that sort of gave us ideas about what these things might mean. Go ahead, Yvonne. <laughs> okay, so I, um, you said you have a nine to one token. So can you give me an idea? Um, how many of these um, interjections that you got uh, in the way you, uh, you you did now are attested also in uh, I mean in other recordings that you had done before where you were not specifically targeting interjections or how many of these are found in the lex lexical existing lexical documentation? I'll uh, embarrass myself by saying um, when I encountered interjections in my lexical database, uh, because they're certainly there, um, I was rather sloppy. You know, I don't know if I was transcribing them as, exactly as they should. This was actually a really nice process because it forced me to to really listen and to say, oh, is this, is, does this have like a like a glottal stop at the end? Does this have a glottal stop, you know? Uh, is uh, uh, is this an extra? Is this produced with an extra high tone? Is this just produced with a high tone? What's the difference there? So this was a process of of sort of really specifying. And what I need to do now is I need to go back and actually re-listen to these um, to these uh, interjections that I have in the larger um, in the larger uh, corpus. Uh, of natural speech. Um, I should say that um, in no case uh, did I hear any interjections produced uh, during the solicitation uh, session that seemed wildly different from the interjections that I would hear in natural Gora speech or being produced like if I was sitting on the on the car in in the car or something like that. So um, nothing that was too wildly out there. But uh, that's a really good um, point, Yvonne, in terms of like a practical documentary approach. This is a nice opportunity now for me to go back and to um, check these elicited uh, um, uh, uh, or these provoked interjections, let's say, with the ones that were produced um, in narratives or in uh, in the natural speech that I've collected. So thanks for that. That's a nice uh, 
it's a nice reminder of the work that that remains. Michael. Thank you, um, Andrew and uh, Anderson, for your interesting talk. So um, I was wondering, maybe I missed this. Uh, the difference, or is there any movement between uh, panlecto and idiolect um, uh, interjections? Are these mutually exclusive, or these are kind of uh, panlecto interjection evolving into uh, a dialecto uh, interjection? Uh, and another one is. Uh, uh, we, in other languages, we have borrowed interjections, and in most cases, these are secondary interjections. Uh, is this uh, the case in Goroa as well? And what are kind of it, what, from which language, for example, and what are the you know features of borrowed uh, interjections? Um, uh, at at some point, you mentioned about decreasing tonal patterns. Um, uh, maybe uh, a little explanation about that. Uh, is it uh, you know, many patterns uh, becoming fewer, or um, is it um, uh, lowering uh, tone pattern? And if it is lowering, of course, um, it, it doesn't this, uh, um, or does this actually uh, specify some kinds of interjections that actually have a decreasing or lower tone patterns? And what are those kind of uh, emotions expressed by lowering or decreasing tone patterns? Thank you. I need to try something out on most of us who are sitting here uh, in terms of in terms of borrowing, but also in terms of this idea of a tonal uh, uh, phenomena. What if I were to go, uh, 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 uh. I'm sure that if I were to do that, or if I were to go tut, 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 or poop, 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 like, those of us who have spent a little bit of time in this part of I, this, you know, this region, wider or smaller, however you want to draw it, I am sure that you have encountered something of this larger species, and I'm sure that you have a sense of what it means, right? And I say a sense, maybe inter rather than a definition, because I, I see you, I see you grinning, Michael, because I'm sure that you got it, like what this, what this could be, right? Um, so then, so then you have to ask, okay, so, so you have this, you have this sort of like, you know, you have this tonal frame, uh, and then, okay, well, is, is this a boring, is this like a larger regional feature? Like, like, what is this? Um, uh, because like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it in English. Like, it's certainly not, it's certainly not part of my, you know, it's certainly not part of my interjective, interjective repertoire, if you want to use that word, um, in English. But it's certainly something that people would identify, whether they're Gorwa speakers or whether they're Hadza speakers or whether they're Swahili speakers, right? So is this borrowed? I don't know. I don't know. I think that that's a great question, though. Michael, you ask three questions. How is this possible? <laughs> and very complex, you know. So, uh, yeah. So what we observed is there is this decreasing tone and pattern. So almost all interjections start with high or extra high uh, tone, and then the subsequent tone on the on another vowel or syllable or tonal carrier if the, the vowel is a long vowel decreases no it's uh, if it's extra high then it's high then it's low etc and you have different different uh, decreasing tonal patterns but uh, it's it's always decreasing it's never increasing we, i think we didn't find a simple single single example of it and, and what 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 this is definitely the case what andrew mentioned that cross linguistically it's not we don't have really data maybe about it what i have observed cross linguistically is that interjections do tend to start or carry high tone especially on the first syllable of vowel no so this is something that would certainly be interesting to to study cross linguistically, but uh, I think even in 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 Arusha actually not our our data also shows that most interjections have uh, high tone or carry high to high tone, and that can be very you know they can one one can propose uh, iconic or cognitive motivation motivations for that. Uh, for borrowing, we uh, Andrew that we didn't find any, and we in our data we don't have any example of it. Of course, it doesn't mean that there are no borrowed interjections. They may have been. We may have just not captured them. What and what is what was very interesting that almost uh, all interjections that we collected are primary interjections, 
there is only one interjection that is certainly secondary and it's still definitely not the case that you know the 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 language has only one secondary interjection it's it's very likely that there are more but it's actually natural that speakers would use these primary interjections as first come to mind because they normally are more instinctive so 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 and that's what we were looking for in our elicitations so you know that can that can be the result of the type of elicitation if we had written texts we would definitely have more secondary interjections definitely and that's that's uh, uh, but but of course we don't have r much written literature in Galwa, so so yeah yeah, <laughs> and and yeah, I don't remember what was the other question, Michael, that you asked. <laughs> in dialectal and, and panlectal. Um, ah, so idiolectal and, uh, and and panlectal interjections are definitely connected, you know, uh, diachronically and conceptually. So we don't, you know, the problem is that we don't know if. All idiolectal interjections are only 100% in the idiolectal. There are idiolectal in our database, in our data. No? But if we, if we let's say, uh, interviewed all the Gora speakers, you know, the picture could be different. But that's, of course, unrealistic. So, 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 but there is certainly a connection between idiolectal and panlectal interjections because, you know, many idiolectal interjections can be sort of reflexes of panlectar interjections and some panlectar interjections or most of them probably or many of them may have emerged from idiolectal interjections as well so there is they, they they are definitely connected we don't that's what we mentioned in the talk we don't see them you know we analyze them as separate sets but they are definitely connected diachronically uh, conceptually cognitively in many many in, in many aspects so they they therefore eventually when we when we propose these bigger clusters, we actually connected both idiolectal and 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 panlectal interjections because all of them would form clusters. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Alexander and Andrew again for their presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar by Martin Maus entitled Tanzanian Cushitic History on Wednesday, the 1st of May.